As we prepare to mark 20 years since 9-11, we're taking a closer look at what that day was like on board Air Force One. On that morning in 2001, then-President George W. Bush was visiting an elementary school in Florida to promote his education program. The president was in front of a dozen second graders when he received the news that America was under attack. Once leaving the school, Air Force One quickly took off where it would fly from one undisclosed loco location to the next for roughly nine hours. Along with President Bush, journalist Ann Compton was aboard Air Force One for ABC News on that day, and Ann joins me now. Ann, it is wonderful to see you again. So you were the Good only television journalist that it's great Thank to see the old reunion. It, you were the only television journalist who was there. You were in that classroom when then President Bush's chief of staff whispered into his ear and informed him of the terrible news. What were your very first thoughts in that moment? We were in such a presidential bubble. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't see the planes crash into the World Trade Centers. But when the White House chief of staff walked into the classroom and leaned down and whispered to the president. It lasted an instant, and then he stepped back. I could tell by the look on the president's face that this was something incredibly grave. We'd heard there'd been a plane crash. I got Andy Card's uh, uh, caught his attention. I made the sign of an airplane going down. He put up two fingers. What we knew was that there was something catastrophic. What we didn't know is the president had already asked American intelligence, what could Al Qaeda do? How could it hurt Americans on U.S. soil? And Anne, as everybody else, it's, it's incredible as, you're, as you recount this, the, the plane and how much planes were playing in our head on that day. You left that school in Florida and then you got on a plane, Air Force One, and then you were in the air essentially for nine hours because the president's security team felt that the safest place for him was to be in the sky. Tell us, what were those hours like? What, what were the conversations that you had with the president and members of the administration? What was, what was the energy like in that plane? It was amazing to me, and especially now in hindsight, how little we knew on board that aircraft. You would think you'd have all the communications in the world. But the president was flying at a high altitude. And back in the, those days, I had a little Motorola clamshell flip phone. I couldn't use that on board the plane. The president had three secure lines with which he could reach the ground. But when Air Force One, for its own safety, went to a much higher altitude, those lines deteriorated. He was so frustrated that he couldn't reach uh, the the D Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon. He couldn't reach the security people. We finally had to land at Barksdale, uh, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana because Air Force One had only had enough fuel on it to get back to Washington. The lack of communications was fearsome for the president. And of course, when we get on the plane, um, we had to have all of our gear checked because the president said we're going back to Washington as we took off from uh, that first uh, stop. The the Pentagon had just been hit. And when the president took off, we found out there was no way we were going back to Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're a, such a veteran journalist and, and, um, and you have covered so much of this nation's history in Washington. Were you entirely in journalism mode? Were the other members of the White House entirely in professional mode? Or was there a, a moment of release of that emotion as we were all experiencing it on 9-11? Actually, we were in such a bubble. We had so little information from the ground. We could tell by watching on the TV screens that are embedded in the bulkhead wall of Air Force One in each cabin, we could see the towers fall. We could see, but we really didn't have any information. Uh, the idea that at that hour of the morning on a weekday, could there have been 20 or 30,000 people in those towers? We couldn't, we couldn't even imagine the destruction. The president 
argued to go back. This is not something he did in front of us. But to his chief of staff, the president said, the leadership requires you have to be telling me. He couldn't see Ahmed, you know, people stuck in the towers. We were just so out of the immediate loop that the rest of the country would have had. But the president argued to go back because he said he was darned if he was going to give a uh, an address to the nation from a hole under the ground in Nebraska. But you know what? That's exactly where he ended up, at a strategic air command base, nuclear bunker. And that's the first time it was eight hours later when the president was told, yes, we looked at the manifests, al-Qaeda operatives were on at very least at that point, the flight that hit the Pentagon. This was a time in which America, first time in my generation, or even my parents' generation, that American civilians were under attack. It was unthinkable. Unthinkable, indeed. Uh, I want to ask you about that. Um, but, but first, just tell us what it was like then when the plane did land in Washington. There was a totally different mood when the president was finally able to head back to Washington. It was about eight hours after the initial attacks in New York and Washington. And the president came back in Air Force One, first to the Secret Service cabin right in front of us. He patted a couple of the guys on the back. Then he came to the door of the press cabin. He didn't come in. There were only two of us left, two reporters left. And he waved away our reporter's notebooks. He waved away the camera. He said, we're going to get those thugs, something like that. And at that mm -hmm. point, the president, with the jet fighters off each wing, uh, the plane was protected, but he knew America was not protected. So we landed with the sense that he, as he told his aides on Air Force One as he returned and Marine One as he returned to the White House, he is now a wartime president. George Bush had only been president for less than eight months. Every president is somewhat vulnerable that first year. Don't have your full staff on board. You don't really embrace the importance of that office. But that night, the president, on the very day this happened, declared the Bush doctrine. If you, as a country, harbor terrorists, you will be an enemy of the United States. And at that moment, I think, really, the presidency of George Bush was defined because he was, for his full eight years then, a wartime president and, in fact, a war that, with Afghanistan, extended 20 years. And such a seminal moment, Anne. Uh, I wonder if, if you've... I know that, that in the way that a journalist and, and somebody that they cover, um, that there is a relationship um, and it, it's bifurcated. But uh, have you, as you've kept in touch with the Bushes, have you talked about this 20-year uh, anniversary as it's coming up? Any reflections on that that you can share? Over the years, I think those of us who've run into each other who were on board the plane have kept in touch. But to me, it's a little more personal. A uh, couple of my kids were off in college. One was in high school here in Washington. What, what we saw the country go through and what I think families went through is pulling closer together. And, and look at how resilient the United States of America has been, how it came back, uh, how uh, the you know, democracy is a really powerful engine and it drives what this country does. Lana, I am now, since then, I've got eight baby grandchildren, and I want them to grow <laughs> up and look at September 11th and think this was a time when America, the democracy may have been attacked by people who don't like the idea of freedom. But the United States uh, represents the best of democracy, and there is a resilience among Americans and our spirit here that lives on today in the name of all those who gave so much, especially on the road recovering and rescues those days. And always really appreciate hearing from you. And
those those impressions not only for the memories of September 11th, but also for those younger generation uh, members that that are looking at this as a moment in history that they don't fully understand. I appreciate it. Thanks, Anne. Thank you, Lana. Absolutely.